Come on, are you thankful for that name today? Come on, his word says there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Come on, do you know his name? Do you know his name? I'm thankful for the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, there's power in that name. There's deliverance in that name because that name is more than just a word. It's a new birth. It's a new life. Oh, hallelujah. It's a complete transformation. It's not just a word on a page, but it represents a complete new life. Oh, hallelujah. Are you thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Such an exciting day here today. Amen. And again, I just uh, want to echo again. We're so thankful for all of our guests and we give you honor. Greater Faith family. Amen. We give you honor. Thank you for being here today. Amen. We'll honor you as a guest today and then we'll welcome you as family next week. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And speaking of family, uh, there's a young lady here today. Uh, Hannah Plymel is going to be baptized in the only saving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. At the conclusion of our service today, she's brought some family and some friends with her. We give all of you honor. Thank you for being here today. We're just delighted and honored that you would come. Amen. And share in this special occasion of her life. Praise God. How many of you are ready for the word this morning? Amen. Amen. A few of you. Just a few of you. How many of you are ready for the word today? Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. Singing songs is great. And worshiping is great. And it's necessary. And it's part of God's plan. But if you don't have the word, you won't be saved. You'll have just had an emotional experience. Uh, the Bible says he chose the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. Uh, hey, we worship to build belief. Uh, we worship to stir up faith. Uh, we worship to magnify God. Uh, we worship to get our flesh out of the way so the word uh, can have free course in our life. Amen. Amen. I want you to go with me today. Uh, and we'll be dismissing faith kids here in just a moment. But I want you to go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Amen. And we are going to read verses 4 through 9. While you're turning there, uh, I did save one announcement that I wanted to make to you personally. Um, and that is on October the 1st, which is Family Sunday. Amen. Um, we are having back here at Greater Faith Evangelist prophet Bobby Wade. Bobby Wade is going to be with us that morning. Amen. And I'm very excited about that. Uh, you know, and the Bible teaches that we need the fivefold ministry. We need the fivefold ministry. We need apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. Amen. And so I, I believe the Lord has linked us up with brother Bobby Wade, and he will be here on the first Sunday in October. And then uh, Sunday night, we have partnered with a church in Manchester, Ohio, uh, which is just a little over an hour from here. It's a small church in a small town, uh, and they are going to have Bobby Wade that evening. And what I would love is I would love for greater faith, for members of greater faith to show up in Manchester at 6 p.m. at the River of Life Church for that evening service. If you are able to make that trip, I'm telling you, it'll be an encouragement. It will be a blessing to that church in Manchester. And let me tell you something. You don't have regional revival unless you get connected with other churches in that region. Amen? Amen. And this is just another God connection for greater faith. And I'm looking forward to the revival that we are going to have on that day. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Period. Mm. And these words 
which I command. This is a command. You just heard two commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and might. That means with all your strength, with all your energy, with everything that is in you, with all of your focus, with all of your virtue. That's how you are to love the Lord thy God. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. This is why I must keep my heart with all diligence to make sure that this absolute truth saturates all of my heart and that all of my heart belongs to him. And that everything my heart may be turned to, taught, or seduced by would first have to pass through the truth of the oneness of God and my complete devotion to Him. These two commands are the compass, the filter, the guide for all things in our lives. And the follow-up of these two commands is equally important and powerful. Verse 7, and thou shalt teach them. Hold on, kids. You need to hear this because I'm obeying the command right now. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down. And when thou Rises up. Ooh. There is no ambiguity in this direction to keep these truths as dominant, driving truths in our heart must be the focal point of our lives. Loving God is not a slice of the pie. He's not a compartment of the whole. He is all in all. Mm. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. And they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house. And on thy gates. You're to keep it always in your view. Put it on a post-it on your bathroom mirror if you have to. Amen. Keeping this guiding and most important commandment in your front view at all times. Deuteronomy 6, excuse me, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 is not to be a peripheral paradigm in our lives, but rather it should be the North Star. Well, you need to hear this today. It ought to be the North Star by which all decisions in your life are made. And it's from this text that I want to preach to you today on the Shema. The Shema. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful to be in your house with your people. God, your presence is evident and resident in this building right now, in our lives. God, I'm asking that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. God, let your word have free course in this place today, God. Let the scales fall from our eyes. God, let our hearts be open to receive your word. Speak to us today. God, let an anointing of revelation Lord, be in this house today in Jesus' name. And let the church say amen. Come on, can you give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Amen. The Shema. The Shema. In Jewish culture, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, would come to be known as the Shema. The children of Israel would often identify passages of Scripture by the first word of the passage. In this case, the Hebrew word for Shema is hear. And hear does not, the English word for hear, does not adequately imply or relate to the reader the full context of the Jewish word Shema. Everybody say Shema. 
quoting the commentary from the Apostolic Study Bible, it says, the Shema is a command to listen, to pay attention, and to obey. See how that's different than just hear, right? It encapsulates everything that hear implies. The passage not only declares Israel's God to be uniquely one, but as a corollary, Israel is to love him with all their heart, soul, and strength. This is so powerful. The Shema is a declaration, hear this, the Shema is a declaration of God's name. The word Lord in all capitals is actually the English representation of the Hebrew name of God in your Bible. So when you see Lord in all caps, it's a representation of the Hebrew name for Lord in your Bible, okay? It's used a thousand times, more than a thousand times in the Old Testament. Though sometimes pronounced Jehovah, it should more properly be pronounced Yahweh. The Tanakh, which is the Jewish translation from the Hebrew, accurately captures the power of the declaration of Deuteronomy 6 and 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. The New Jerusalem Bible reads, Listen, Israel, Yahweh, our God, is the one, the only Yahweh. Huh. Greater Faith Apostolic Church, I have come to preach the Shema to you today. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He is one. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. James 2 and 19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Let me tell you this morning, and it may sting just a little bit. If you don't believe that God is one, then you believe less than our adversary believes. Because our adversary knows and believes that God is one. Right. Ah, I was a little weak, but we'll get there together. When Philip came to the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts, the eunuch was in his chariot alone reading the book of Isaiah. How many of you have ever read that story? He was reading the passage penned by the prophet Isaiah that reads, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shear. So opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Then the eunuch asked Philip, is Isaiah talking about himself? Or is he talking about some other man? Woo. Then Philip, everybody say Philip. Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Woo. <laughs> when Philip preached Jesus unto him, he preached to him about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. How do you know it? Because all these three are one. Is this talking about God or is it talking about some other man? And Philip said, let me preach to you about Jesus, the one and only God. There are not three expressed persons or entities 
that compromise one Godhead. Hmm. All right. I'll just go ahead and stay on that then. There are not three persons in the Godhead. Paul warned us about the Trinitarian doctrine before that doctrine was even created or ratified at the Council of Nicaea when he wrote to the church of Colossae. He said, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily what was he saying he is the father he is the son and he is the holy ghost in him dwelleth all the fullness of the godhead bodily paul said don't you be deceived by another teaching there is only one god and his name is jesus christ and he again he goes on to say and you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. That's why we get excited about the name of Jesus Christ because it is not like any other name. In that name is all principality and power. Ah. Philip. Everybody say Philip. Preach the oneness of God to the Ethiopian eunuch. Woo. You got a problem with the oneness? I would encourage you to go back and read your four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because it was the oneness of God that got God killed. They crucified him because he said... I am God. He professed to be God in the flesh. And they said, no, we reject that doctrine. We reject that truth. You cannot be king of the Jews. You cannot be a son of David. You cannot be God. Woo. Mm, it's tight here today. It's all right. There's a saying. If it's tight, it's right. He preached repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Woo! That's what Philip preached to the eunuch. Well, how do you know that? Read your Bible. There's a whole lot in this book. You know, it's funny how often we come to conclusions without spending any time inside the script. Well, somebody told me one time, and I, I heard from this person or that person. I, I just came to my own conclusion. Friend, get in the book. The book speaks for itself. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. How do you know he preached salvation to the eunuch? Watch this. Acts chapter 8, beginning with verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized. The eunuch saw it. The same Jesus in Isaiah is the same Jesus that was on the cross. Is the same Jesus that rose three days later. Is the same Jesus that poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost. I want to be buried with him in baptism. I want his name on my life. Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? We do real good to get the mindset of the eunuch. This independent spirit is killing our world where we just write our own doctrine and we just 
author our own opinions. We need to get back to how the early church was born where every time the word was preached a question was asked should I be baptized do I need to be baptized what do I need to do to be saved teach me how to repent show me the way preach to me preacher I'm done doing it my way Ah, hallelujah the eunuch asked him, is there any reason why I shouldn't be baptized? And Philip said, and this is so powerful. Woo! I'm about to walk all over false doctrine. You ready? If thou believest with all thine heart. Does that sound familiar? Well, if you'll just believe. If you'll just believe. Woo! Man, I feel pressure in this room. But I love pressure. Let me tell you something. Belief leads you to salvation. It is not salvation in and of itself. Mm, Hallelujah. That's why Paul preached. Some of you just went to Romans 10. Let's go ahead and go to Romans 10. Paul said, if you believe in him with all your heart, you shall, future tense, be saved. Hey, is there any reason, Brother Hammond, why I should not be baptized? He said, the only reason I can give you is if you don't believe in the oneness of God. If you don't believe that Jesus was the mighty God in Christ, then you should not be baptized. But if you believe that the same one that died on the cross rose again, poured out his spirit, then you should be baptized. Oh, hallelujah. He said, if you believe with all your heart, thou mayest, if you believe the Shema, you believe that Jesus is the mighty God in Christ. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Woo! Now let's go ahead and talk about that. All right? Because I'm going to tell you right now, some of y'all get all messed up, not understanding some terminology. In your Bible. We're going to have a little Bible lesson right in the middle of this message. Y'all ready for it? Be a real good time to take some notes. So the next time you're reading your Bible, you're like, hold on, let me get my reading glasses. Pastor taught me what lens to look through when I read this terminology so I understand what it means. What are three terminologies in your Bible? That are used to describe the Lord. One is son of David. Anybody ever read that before? Blind Bartimaeus shouted out, son of David, have mercy. Woo. What is son of David? Why is he called the son of David? The son of David refers to the lineage of God. How many of you knew that? All right, one person. Excellent. The lineage of God. I'm in the right place today. Son of David is the lineage of God. Mary, his mother, who was flesh and blood, was of the lineage of King David. Authorizing Jesus to be the king of the Jews. He could not have been the king of the Jews if he was not Jewish. But he descended through the lineage of David and his mother came right out of that bloodline. That's why the Bible calls him son of David. Good? Everybody everybody good? All right. We're not taking questions, but you know. You save your questions for after. Son of man. How many of you have ever read that? Son of man. Son of man speaks to the manifestation of God. How he revealed himself while he was here on earth. 
Acts 2.36 says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Both the Shema and Christ. Both flesh and God. Ah. Acts 2.36 is the foundational explanation of why we can call Jesus the mighty God in Christ. It is because he is the son of flesh and blood through his mother. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost and he was born flesh and blood. He didn't have an earthly father. Woo! Y'all, y'all going to want to stay with me today because we have a destination. He did not have divine flesh, but he did have miraculous conception. He was fully God and fully man. You, Brother Jim Went, are just as much a spirit as you are flesh and blood. When the Bible uses the terminology, the Son of Man, it is emphasizing the human nature of God, the flesh nature that he was robed in. He had a human nature, a carnal, fleshly nature like you and I. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 and 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You know what that means? That means at some point he had to overcome the temptation to lie. At some point he had to overcome the pride of life and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the love of money. What was that? That was his sinful, carnal, fleshly nature. It was the son of man. Yet without sin. Mm. Now, what about Son of God? Right? That's the candy stick. Son of God. Well, explain that. Okay. Son of God speaks to the origin of God. Mary was conceived of the Holy Ghost. You ready for this? Yeah, y'all ain't. He did not have an earthly father. But it was the Spirit of God that impregnated Mary. This is all in your Bible, by the way. It was the Spirit of God wrapped in flesh when you saw Jesus Christ. He was the Son of God because it was His own Spirit that caused the conception of His birth. When Jesus would pray... It's just like you and me. He had a flesh nature that had to pray. He had to pray. Why did he have to pray? Because he had a flesh nature just like you and I did. Yes is the answer to your question. Yes, he was praying to himself, to the Spirit of God, which he embodied when he prayed to the Father. Mm. Is everybody with me? Is this clear as mud, or are you guys with me? All right. <laughs> I was not confidence building. <laughs> the Father was not a separate entity or person. It was the Spirit of God Himself. His flesh had to pray. You and I pray to Him because in us is our human spirit. In Him was the Spirit of God. And just like you cannot separate me from my human spirit and call me two different entities, you cannot separate the spirit of God from the man Christ Jesus. He is, was, uh, and will always be one. Ah. 
This is all just groundwork for my main point. John 3, 16, another candy stick verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You ought to understand what that means now. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Woo! Why is this terminology so important in these scriptures? Because only belief in the name, in the Shema, in Yahweh, in Jesus, can lead you to salvation. Son of God emphasizes the divine origin of God manifest in the flesh. This was not just a man. He was fully God and fully man. The Spirit of God, not a man, caused miraculous conception in the Virgin Mary to manifest himself in the flesh. He was the Son of God. Now, remember our story of Philip. Remember I kept having you say Philip. Right, Because I wanted you to remember who it was. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The Bible says Philip preached unto him Jesus. Whew. Let me show you why this is so powerful. John, the author of John 3.16, also recounts to us in his gospel a very important story about Philip in John chapter 14. When Philip himself was struggling to see the revelation of the Shema. He was struggling to see the revelation of the oneness of God. Let's read about it. John 14, beginning in verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me, hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The reason Philip could preach Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch is because he knew him as the mighty God in Christ. He knew the Shema. He knew Isaiah 44 and 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first. I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Philip knew him as the Father, he knew him as the Son, and he knew him as the Holy Ghost. Mm. Ha! These are not three express persons of the Godhead. These are the three manifestations of one Godhead. Woo! Hallelujah. How powerful to think that the one true God that gave us his spirit would often refer to his spirit as water a river of living water he talked about it in Ezekiel he talked about it in the New Testament oh my god water Woo. <laughs> something pretty awesome about water water can be manifested in three ways gas, liquid and solid but it's all water mm. 
Water can be invisible, it can be solid, and it can be liquid. But no matter what state it is manifest in, it is still water. It is still water. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He is one. He is one. He is the rose of Sharon. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the bright and morning star. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. He is the author and the finisher. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is Jesus. He is the son of David. He is the son of man. He is the son of God. He is one. He is the father. He is the son. He is the Shema. He is Yahweh. He is Jehovah. He is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the name given among men whereby we must be saved. We must. Do you have to baptize in Jesus' name? Yes. He is the name given among men whereby we must, we must be saved. He is God, and beside him there is none other. He is God. He is Jesus, and he is here today. He is the name that saves you. He is the blood that redeems you. He is the spirit that fills you. He is the God that hears you. He is the fire that answers you. He is the help that saves you. He is Jesus. Whoa! John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Woo. Skip down to verse 14. Not because the others aren't important but because I figured by this time in the sermon you'd be wanting me to wrap it up. So move down to verse 14. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God and the Word about to say the Word capital W. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. The glory as well as the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. He is the cosmos. He is the logos. He is the Shema. He is God. He is one and His name is Jesus. Now, I'm going to preach my message. Praying in my driveway Friday morning, the Lord began to deal with me and He put this thought in my spirit. How many of you have ever heard, and this is Bible based, the sins of the Father come upon the sins of the Son? You ever heard that, right? Maybe the verbiage was a little different, but the, the paradigm is the same. Sins of the Father visit upon the sins of the Son, right? The ultimate evidence against a triune God is that truth in your Bible right there. If you didn't understand anything else I said today, you're going to understand this. The Bible says that the sins of the Father come upon the Son, right? That's an absolute truth. Does everybody agree that your Bible says that and that that is true? All right. Not everybody, but I'm going to just preach to those that agree. If a father is an alcoholic, a drug addict, an abuser, a manipulator, a womanizer, a liar, a cheater, statistically and biblically, unless there is a change in fathers, the son will bear the burden of his father's sin. He will either repeat them or it will affect him in other ways. He'll deal with lack of confidence and security, not being able to embrace his calling as a man to to lead his wife and his kids. The main point here is the son bears consequences of the father's sin. 
This is the or that truth is the origin of dysfunction. All right, nobody said amen. When the family unit is broken, dysfunction starts. Now, a good father understands this. And the Bible affirms this. Who being a good father, if his son asked him for bread, would give him a stone, the Bible says. That speaks to the nature of a good father. Jesus did something that no other father has ever done. He made a way for dysfunction to be reversed through new birth and restoration. Adam was also a son of God, but he was not deity. And Adam, as we all know, fell into sin in the garden. He gave in to his wife and disobeyed God. And as a result, sin came into the world. That wasn't the father's sin. That was the sin of Adam. The created one. The son of God. The Bible says we are all the sons and daughters of God. Without choice, we were born. Without choice, we were born into sin. So our heavenly father decided... Did you all know that you are all descendants of Adam and Eve? Everybody know that, right? That's why you were born into sin. So our Heavenly Father decided, I'm going to bear the consequence of sin. I'm going to restore the relationship with the Son. I'm going to make a way for that garden relationship of Eden to be restored with my creation. I'm going to make a way for my likeness to be restored in my creation. Our Heavenly Father said, even though I did not commit the sin, I'm going to pay the price for the sin. I'm going to suffer for the sins of the Son. Not the son suffering for the sins of the father. He said, I'm going to suffer for the sins of the son. I'm going to bear the cross for the damage and destruction of the abuser, the manipulator, the cheater, the liar, the deviant, because they are my kids, because I created them. I'm going to pay the debt of sin and make a way for them to escape the consequence of death, damnation, and eternity without God. This is how I know that there is only one God. Because if there was a God that in the literal sense which is what the Trinity declares to be true. I know I'm offending some people today, but let the truth confront you today. If there was a God that would send his literal son to pay the price of sin, instead of doing it himself, he would be no better than us. If I become an alcoholic, I say I'm okay with my son paying the price for my selfishness and my sin. If I'm addicted to anger and pornography and I got all kinds of problems and I'm a womanizer and a whoremonger and I'm running around and I'm all messed up, I'm saying I'm okay with my son bearing the weight of my sin. My kids paying for my sins is the system of sin. If I'm angry and hateful and abusive, they bear the scars of that sin. 
If I'm absent and a liar and a cheater, my kids bear the marks of those sins. But God, our Father, our good, good Father, decided I'm going to reverse the course of sin and destruction. He decided that my sins and your sins do not have to be passed down. They can be passed up to him. Oh, hallelujah. Instead of guaranteed dysfunction, Calvary was the interruption that saved us from our sure destruction. Oh. My father became the son of God by origination when he was miraculously conceived of a virgin. He became the son of David in lineage and was raised by his earthly father, stepfather, Joseph. And most importantly, he became the son of man putting on real flesh and blood. And my father woo, went to the cross has a visible manifestation of God that the scripture for the purpose of distinction calls the Son. And my Father died on that cross for the sins of all mankind. The Father loved His kids so much He would not allow the wages of sin to become their inheritance. So He reversed the curse of sin and He took the consequence on Himself. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, my father did not pass on the marks of sin to me. Even though it was my sin, he took them on himself at Calvary. Woo. He did not pass that dysfunction on to me. He made a way out of dysfunction and into restoration for all of us. I don't live today in the consequences of a sinful father, I live in the restoration of a loving father who took my sins to Calvary. So I would not have to inherit the wages of sin, which is death. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is why Jesus looked at Philip and said, I am my father. Or what? I'm almost done. Only an abusive father would use his son as an escape goat for sin. But a loving father says, wait, let me pay the price for your mistakes. Let me take on the wages of sin so that you can have another chance at life and life more abundantly. Our Heavenly Father made it clear. There will be, don't miss this, there will be temporal consequences for our sin. The Bible says it, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But he went to Calvary for every son and daughter of Adam. That's humanity. So that all of us would have the opportunity to take eternity off the table of consequence. Whew. Friend of mine, if I go to hell, it's only because I would not accept what the Father offered. If I go to hell, it's only because I rejected His sacrifice and His pathway of redemption. The only way I can escape the sin consequence of my first father Adam is for me to have a new father Jesus Christ the righteous Jesus Christ the righteous that's why I must be born again I need a new father Without a new father, I inherit the wages of my first father, Adam, which is sin. 
I need to be born again. This is why the Shema is so important. It is the power of a love undivided. I don't have to decide today who or what comes first in my life because the Lord of my life made that clear. My highest devotion, my greatest commitment, my all in all belongs to Him. Anything in my life that competes with my love and devotion for Him loses because of the Shema. I won't make room for rivals in my heart. Since He is first, I will not allow anything or anyone else to compete for my love and devotion that belongs to Him. I'm not going to make room for the temporal to come into contention with the eternal in my life. If it causes God to come in second, to wait, to move over, to not get my best, to not get my first, to not get my all, then I say no. Why? Because here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And I will love the one with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my might. Would you stand with me this morning? In a few moments, we're going to baptize Hannah in the only saving name of Jesus Christ. The one true God, the Son of Man, the Son of David, the Son of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to go with me in our closing text to the book of John chapter 3. And we're going to read the words of Jesus in his conversation with Nicodemus. Jesus answered, verily, verily. That means listen, Shema, hear this. It's important. Don't miss this. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he can not enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. If I want him to bear the consequence of my sin, I must be born again. I need him to be my father. Not just in typology, not just in symbolism, but in name. Hannah, when you go down in that water today, Paul said in Romans 6, you're buried with him in baptism. And when you come up, you're going to have a new name. <laughs> Written upon your life today. You know why that matters? Because one day we're all going to stand before God. And the Bible says we're going to give an account, Jim. We're going to give an account. But guess whose name is going to be on my paperwork? Guess whose name will have blotted out everything I've ever done that offended the righteousness and the holiness of God? Guess whose blood story is going to be written as my story? On the day of judgment. You know, your blood records everything you've ever done. But when you're buried with him in baptism, and they say, come on, let's see what Jim did. You know what they're going to see? Huh. They're going to see this right here. They're going to see the story of Jesus Christ 
the righteous. Sorry, Jim, they're not going to read about Bert's Pet Center. <laughs> they're not going to read about all that good work you've done over there on that house. They're going to read about this. He's going to read about Calvary. He's going to read about redemption. Oh, you're part of the lineage. You're part of the story. You're part of the bloodline. You got the name. You're one of mine. I don't want to be judged as a stranger. I want to be judged as a son. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Let me tell you something. Everybody in this room, the Bible charges you to make your calling and election sure. Your salvation is your responsibility. I cannot save you. I can only preach truth to you. And the truth says you must repent. You must be baptized in Jesus' name. And you must be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. We've seen over 50 people receive the gift of the Holy Ghost here at Greater Faith over the last 15 months. Almost 30 people have been baptized in the name of Jesus. We might be over 30 now. Let me tell you something. God is saving people. And if you are here today and you have never been baptized in the only saving name of Jesus... If you have never been filled with His Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you must be born again. Whew, hallelujah. If you want to take your next step with God today, I'm invited, no matter where you are in your journey, if you've been in church your whole life or if it's your first time in church, I'm inviting every person in this room to make a move towards God this morning, to step out of your robe, and come down here to the front. And we're going to pray together as the family of God. And God's going to begin to minister. God's going to begin to move. God's going to pour out of His Spirit upon all flesh. God's going to begin to talk to some hearts this morning. God's going to begin to invite some people to take a step that they perhaps have not taken before. There's some people, God's saying, come on, step out. Just repent. If repentance is all you can manage, then let repentance be the beginning of your journey. Some people, God's talking to you today about being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We got warm water. We got robes. We got towels. We got everything you need. You can be baptized in the only saving name of Jesus today. Some of you are saying, I want to be filled. I want to be filled with His Spirit. You can be filled with the Spirit of God today. Come on, all across this room. Can we just begin to respond to the drawing of the Lord, to the drawing of His Spirit today? Can you lift your voice and cry out, Oh God, we need you. Lord, you are one. And beside you, there is none other. Lord, we need you in baptism. Lord, we need to be filled with your Spirit. Lord, we need to be redeemed by your blood. Oh, we need to be buried with you in baptism. God, I need you to forgive me of my sins. I need you to order my steps to lead me and guide me into all truth. God, everything you are, I need. You are the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Go ahead. Come on, begin to pray one with another right now. Come on, find somebody to pray with today. Redeemer, defender, our great and mighty Savior.
there's no one higher than you Your beauty, your splendor, your glory knows no measure There's no one higher than you No